the world may have avoided a Western military intervention in Syria for now. As you'll probably know, the Obama administration was rather keen on a military strike after chemical weapons were used against civilians in Syria. But the man whom Time magazine has called America's best theologian says his country is all too ready to advocate war. That's because, in its own way, war has become a Christian religious ritual. Professor Stanley Hauerwas is a theologian at Duke University's acclaimed Divinity School, and he's the author of the recent book, War and the American Difference. He was in Australia recently to give a series of lectures at New College at the University of New South Wales, and that's where I caught up with Stanley Hauerwas. There's no question we have a predisposition to war because America is a status quo power in the world. Any changes in the world we think is a threat to our power. So we necessarily think that we have the right of intervention for, quote, peace. And by peace, we mean order that is favorable to us. To what extent has America's history and its public theology contributed to this? Because I believe this is a big theme of yours. Interestingly enough, we were an isolationist power up to World War I. Uh, World War I was really a very significant event in America that gave us the presumption that the world depended upon our interventions. The effect of World War I on America is so different than the effect in Europe because World War I was such a devastating, senseless, murderous event for Europe, and she still remembers it. America remembers World War I still as our becoming a world power, that the world needs us. But I think you, as I, if I read you correctly, you think that uh, much of what we might call America's public theology has contributed to an appetite for war. Well, I think war is a liturgical event for America. It's where we sacrifice the youth of the present generation to assure us that the sacrifice of youth in the past generations, we are worthy to receive that sacrifice. So war becomes a great moral event through which an exchange is made to assure us that America is a country worth making sacrifices for in terms of the future of our national ethos. That sounds to me, though, rather more like a kind of retrospective justification. I'm wondering to what extent you think the theology itself, the religious teaching, even the religious fervor, prompts that kind of killing. Well, America and Christianity have been closely identified. So one of the great problems in America is how the language of the Christian sacrificial world has been translated into the national language. And that's true both for the religious right and the non-religious left. Now, you have been a critic of the idea that there's such a thing as a just war. I mean, that puts you in an interesting, if contradictory, position to thousands or at least hundreds of years of theology going back to St. Augustine, doesn't it? Yes, that's a very complex question. For example, if you think that the intervention into Syria that we were going to enact, on what possible grounds could that be just war? Syria hadn't been attacking America and so on. So in many ways, I'm more than ready to enter into considerations of a just war type with Christian just warriors because I think that it would be a severe limit on the war-making character of the American foreign policy. 
Let's talk just uh, briefly about the Syria scenario because that is the one that has prompted you to sort of re-enter the public debate since your book was published, mm. I think, last year, War and the American Difference. Do you think that any potential uh, strike on Syria could be justified under a, a Christian just war principle? No, I do not. I do not see how that could possibly be the case because one of the first criteria of just war is that it be a war of last resort and that it be a response to an offense against your particular country. And I can't see how Syria would fit either of those. You must be able to discriminate between uh, combatants and non-combatants. That's very difficult to do in Syria. What about the argument that's obviously advanced that uh, the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad has extracted an awful price on innocent lives and this chemical warfare attack presumed as it is, suspected as it is, is only the latest manifestation and something must be done to curb a power like that. I find uh, the concentration on the chemical weapons quite odd. They used artillery in Aleppo uh, clearly against civilian targets. Why suddenly concentrate on the use of chemical weapons as opposed to conventional weapons as a justification? I don't get that. I think it's uh, symbolic. What about the Christian notion, though, of standing up for the victim? I mean, this is, I think, a challenge to all Christians who profess a pacifism. I mean, there must be a point at which an oppressor must be uh, confronted. I think that's right, and you use every imaginative way you can to resist the bully short of killing the bully. And that's the reason why our imaginations have been uh, shortchanged about possible interventions that are not murderous, because we assume our first task is to kill rather than to prevent. You identify strongly as a Christian pacifist. How, in your worldview, can a moral power confront an immoral power in that circumstance, if force is not an option? Well, people often put that kind of question, for example, about Nazi Germany. And I often point out who fought in Hitler's armies. Who fought in Hitler's armies were good Catholics and Lutherans. All I'm trying to do is help Christians learn how to say no. By learning how to say no, it requires imaginative forms of resistance that we have lost the ability to enact. And I think that there are all kinds of ways to say no. I guess what I'm getting around to is the critique that's been made of some of your work, and indeed of much of the pacifist mm -hmm. argument, that pacifism relies, in a sense, on force that's gone before it to secure a world in which pacifism is possible. I'm sure that's right, and why deny it? The ultimate challenge is that if you're committed to nonviolence, you may have to watch, finally, the innocent suffer for your convictions. And that's true, however, if you are committed to just war. If you're committed to just war, it would have been better for more Japanese and more Americans to die on the beaches of Japan rather than drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That was not justifiable by just war. So any serious moral position means that finally the innocent will have to suffer, possibly for your convictions. And then you have to figure out how to live in the light of that. Professor Stanley Howas, thank you very much for sharing some time with us today on the Religion and Ethics Report. It's good to be with you. Thank you.